I first demonstrated digital photography to the company in 1976, the technology was very immature. And so um, the questions I got wasn't necessarily how it worked, but why anybody would like this approach to photography. Because it didn't involve all of the conventional thoughts that went with photography for the last 100 years. For example, it didn't involve prints. And they felt that everybody wanted prints. Okay, Nobody wanted to view their pictures electronically. Okay. so. Uh, they allowed us to technically work on it. I've worked continuously in digital photography since 1975 inside of Kodak. I wasn't allowed to tell anybody about it and more people started working on it as well and we really weren't very public about it because we still wanted to maintain the face that uh, silver halide photography was still the best form of imaging. In 1975, I, I showed a photographic system. It worked. It was a whole digital photographic system. We showed the pictures on the screen. We took pictures in the conference room, much like this, and it showed up there. Um, they felt it was, it was uh, such an odd thing that they didn't really take it seriously, but they let me keep working on it, and other people started working on it. But you know what the key was for us in terms of investment from the company? It's when Sony announced Mavica, which was an alternative approach in 1981. And they were not able to practically implement that for many years, but they announced that they were gonna get into the photographic business. And nothing scares management than a powerful new competitor. And so in 1981, we got a lot more funding to do a lot of different work. And we were able to start some subdivisions that were concentrated in this particular area of digital imaging. There was a lot of organizational changes. Companies love to reorganize, okay? But, but, but in essence, we invested throughout the 1980s in this technology, made very few public demonstrations. I'll show you one in the talk today. Um, but uh, it wasn't until 1990 we started actually approaching customers in very narrow segments with very narrow marketing. Uh, to see if people would like a digital camera. And in fact, they did, and what I mentioned to you before, those different marketplaces. That's how we approached it. So five years of kind of wandering in the wilderness, but keep poking at it. And then 10 years of getting more funding, mainly because of external threats that appeared to be um, viable. They turned out to not be a good threat, but it appeared to be viable. Uh, when I first joined Kodak, I would, I would say they were the dominant photographic supplier in the world. And so competition was very limited. We did get some competition, obviously, from Fuji and Agfa. Um, but quite frankly, uh, the barrier to entry in manufacturing photographic film was very, very high. It was very complex to do. Um, the, all the equipment was specialist, specialized. Um, and so, and most of it was protected by trade secrets. It was not public information. So we had relatively few competitors in that field. But when we transitioned to the digital world, one, we couldn't control all of the technology associated with it like we had in the, in the silver halide world because we controlled the chemicals, we controlled the photo finishing equipment, the cameras themselves, the films, the papers, all of those things were made by Kodak. got to the digital world, there were many more competitors, the barrier to entry was much lower, and it was a, it was a electronics, was, was Sony and Canon, these people, that's what they, that's what they did, and Kodak had to uh, come up to speed in the electronic world. Uh, I, I think just about every company has to be very concerned about the technological changes that occur they're occurring more rapidly now, of course, than what, what hit Kodak, but with the same effect, I think. Any company that's resting on a certain technology, that's providing goods and services to, com to customers using established techniques, um, has to be very wary of the changes that are taking place. Uh, so I, I can't name particular companies because uh, every situation is different. What happened to Kodak was, I would call, a massive technological discontinuity that occurred over a period of probably about 15 years or so. Um, I suspect that most of the changes that will occur in the next few years will occur even more rapidly than that. Uh, 
So I don't. I think it's inevitable that you'll see other companies uh, taken over by. Them. I would. I would say uh, patience. Okay, and a um, uh, clear understanding that to grow a giant business takes some time. Kodak, in many cases, became impatient with their new businesses. Now, a lot of the businesses that, were in, that Kodak was involved with are presently very active businesses by other companies, and they're doing quite well. So there was profitability there, but it was always compared to the profitability that we had gained with photographic paper and film. And so that never looked very good, and individual managers or uh, organizations were always compared to how we did with film. Well, be aware of what your potential disruptions are, okay? Then actively try to reinvent yourself or destroy your own business in a sense, okay? And then it's not just enough to have the idea. You have to have a clear path that allows those innovators to go and implement these things and to use whatever they need to, whatever the power of Total has in terms of its channel bandwidth or anything else like that, allow them to actually try this stuff for real. The biggest problem, I think, for major corporations is letting go. Letting go for new ideas so that they can go off and do that. Kodak had a problem with that. I can share some stories in the talk. But, but uh, you, have to let, you have to let these ideas go out there, challenge them to go and implement them. That is, we had a gate process for commercialization where you would go through a prototyping stage and engineering models and then you would put it out the real product and then you would generate a business model and you go out in the real world and try to sell it or implement a service. And you have to allow them to do that. And sometimes when you're doing that, it will come in conflict with an existing channel or existing market that you have. Upper management has to arbitrate between those two that balance off present profitability with future growth. That's the job of, of management. And sometimes that's difficult, especially for publicly held companies that have to report dividends. Um, that always becomes a real challenge for upper management. Um, but you have to do that because you got to say to yourself, in five years, I'm going to need these new guys. Not just put up with them. I'm going to need them. So if you've got new ideas, it's going to have to be an R&D bet. But you have to let them get out there and start to commercialize, not just for the company, but for the people involved. Innovators don't survive if they don't get out there and see their products start to happen. I saw many brilliant people get sort of fed up and walk away because they weren't being listened to. You've got to give them a chance to get out there, and management's got to support them. Even if they fail, you'll learn something. Okay? And your public has to see you as being innovative and trying to do provide the best possible future for them in terms of energy right, in this particular case. And if that means changing something, they got to know that your company is willing to change. And then they'll stay with you. It's, it's not just, it's, it's, in the case of Kodak, the top managers, I knew the CEOs, they were, they got it. They were really smart people. It was hard to get the middle of the company, the middle management of the company to move. A lot of our people in our company had been lifelong Kodak people, okay? They had been there for 35, 40 years. They've established organizations. Maybe they built them themselves, okay? They were reluctant to change. It was very hard to, for the upper management to actually get change here. I think that was one of the biggest problems that they faced, and uh, some of them actually mentioned that to me. So uh, I think that's the real challenge is the middle has to get afraid. The top usually probably is. Uh, it's the middle. How do we get them afraid? And sometimes that takes pretty drastic action on the part of upper management in order to change things, whether it's and not just changing organization. It could be changing compensation ways of doing things. It may be changing the way you promote people. But something that goes to the heart of people's middle management's profession has to make, a, it has to make an impact. We're no longer going to evaluate you this way. We're going to evaluate you. Remember what they used to do in 3M or GE? We were going to evaluate you not on how profitable you are, but how much money you're making from products you introduced in the last three years or something.